Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Again, my name is Brian Marvel, and we are so glad that you are here this morning. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. So not yesterday, but last weekend, last Saturday, uh, our girls' school, right, they go to Roosevelt School here in Tosa, they put on a Saturday morning, like, playground, play date for whoever wanted to come from the school. And so there was a local gym that came and did some activities for the kids on the basketball court. The school was providing snacks and drinks, and it was just a great day, a great morning to connect with other kids and other families in the school. And since it had snowed, right, a couple of days before, there was snow on the ground, so it was like, you know, the first time our kids have played in the snow this winter. And so we go to the, the playground, we'd spend some time playing, and a couple hours in, all of the kids had done all of the activities that were set there to do, so it just became one big playground play date. There's like a hundred kids on the playground, and the school recently redid their playground, so they have this new merry-go-round on the playground. And so somewhere along the way, my kids come and they're like, Dad, push us on the merry-go-round. And that's when I realized I'm old because I got winded and my shoulder was sore just from pushing kids on the merry-go-round. So I'm pushing them and I'm trying to get into it and hurting my shoulder and I'm slipping because there's snow on the ground and we're going faster and kids are flying all over the place. It was a great time. And I look up and I see across the playground a friend of mine named Matt. And so I'm pushing and I'm like, oh, when I get too tired, I'm going to go say hi to Matt. And I do. And Matt's talking with some other guy I'd never met before. And so I'm like walking over there like, you know, huffing and puffing, huffing and saying hi to Matt and meeting this other guy. And a couple kids come over and they're like, come push us again. And Matt's kids were part of that group. So I'm like, Matt, it's your turn now. You get to go push the kids on the merry-go-round. So he goes and he introduces me to this guy and we start talking and have a conversation. And somewhere along the way, he asks what I do for a job, which when you're a pastor and somebody asks you what you do for a job, it's always a weird thing. Like, what do I say? How is this? How are they going to respond to this? But I just come right out and say, yeah, I'm a pastor at a church near the village, Meadowbrook Church. And it was really interesting because pretty quickly, the conversation on his initiative took a spiritual turn. And so we started talking about spiritual things. And then my friend Matt comes over and he's like, all right, now it's your turn to go. So I go over and I'm pushing the kids on the merry go round and, and we start doing this. We kind of swap. My friend Matt's talking to him. I go and talk to him. And we have this choppy conversation about spiritual things. And then after a few more rounds of that choppy conversation, we have to get going because we have other things that we have to do. And so I say bye to Matt. I say bye to this guy. Great talk to you. And we head home. So my friend Matt and I, we run a couple mornings a week. And so on Thursday morning, we were running and I said, hey, how did the conversation finish up with that guy who we were talking to on the playground? He's like, oh yeah, it was really good. The, the spiritual nature of the conversation continued after you left. And somewhere along the way in our conversation, he came right out and he said, you know, I've always wondered for people who are Christians, what does your faith do for you? And while we were running, I was like, oh, he asked you that? I was like, I would love it for somebody to ask me that. Like, I would have so many things to say if somebody said, what does your faith do for you? And I wonder this morning if you've ever thought of that. If somebody came to you and asked you that question, what does your faith do for you? What would you say? What would you say without saying, well, it gets me into heaven when I die? Not because eternity and afterlife isn't insignificant, insignificant, but I think when people ask that question, what does your faith do for you? They want to know what does it do for you in the here and now? Like, what does it do for you today? Because if our faith is only applicable once we die and does nothing for us in the here and now, like, why have faith? I mean, yes, it gets us something when we die, but I think we all want a faith that does something for us now and today. And so I asked my friend, I'm like, so, so what did you say? 
how did you answer that question? He said, well, I started to talk about how when we look out in the world, we see that there's this weird mixture of beauty in the world, but also intense brokenness. And my faith helps me live in the tension between the beauty and the brokenness of our world. And it reminds me that there's a trajectory of our faith, that our history is headed somewhere. And there's going to be a day in the future where God will send his son Jesus to come back and he's going to make everything right. And the beauty at that time will overtake the brokenness. It's like, that's a really good answer. <laughs> I'm going to write that down and remember that. But again, how would you answer that? If somebody came to you and says, what does your faith do for you? How would you answer it? And maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, yeah, I've, I've been wondering that. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I have no idea, actually. I've been a follower for, of Jesus for a while now, and I'm trying to grapple with that and make sense of that. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're seeking and you're investigating and you're kind of in discovery mode of like, what does this Christianity thing do for these people who call themselves Christians? Like, what in the world does it do for you? Maybe you've been a, a Christian your whole life and you're in this place of kind of rethinking your faith and you really want to know the answer to that question. Well, fortunately for all of us this morning who are wrestling with that, Romans 5 actually begins to answer that for us. And this is how Romans 5 begins. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified. Now, what's happening, happening here is we are jumping into the middle of a flow of thought for Paul. And the clue, the thing that indicates we are jumping in to the middle of a flow of thought for Paul is the word therefore, right? Therefore, since we have been justified. Now, you probably were taught somewhere along the way in English class that whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask the question, what is it there for, right? But therefore is a connecting word, meaning therefore is simply connecting the current content with everything that has come before it. Therefore is also a concluding word. Paul is trying to bring something, this certain flow of thought to a conclusion. And in Romans, Paul has spent the last two chapters talking about this theme of justification. And here he's starting to wrap up that flow of thought. And by saying, since we have been justified, he's going to speak to the effect that it has in our lives. Essentially, he's going to answer the question, what does it do for you? Which is important. Because justification is a hefty theological word. And sometimes big theological words can seem very disconnected from our everyday lives. Like when someone starts to speak in terms of atonement theory, ecclesio ecclesiology, and the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures, you could be like, hey there guy, like I'm just trying to get through my day, not being overrun by worry, because I've maxed out my credit cards, I've overdrawn on my bank account, and I've got a stack of bills that I need to pay, and that's the thing that's pressing on me. Or if somebody talks in terms of dispensationalism and eschatology, you could be thinking to yourself, you know, I, I'm just trying to make it through my day without losing my cool on my kids who have just ripped open a whole bag of goldfish in the backseat of my car that we just bought at the store 10 minutes ago, and now it's crushed on the floor of my car. Like dispensationalism, covenantal theology, atonement theory, those things seem very disconnected in our lives and seem to have no bearing on our everyday, day-to-day -day lives. But here, Paul is saying justification does. Justification has a very tangible impact on your day-to-day -day life. But in order to understand that impact, we first have to understand what justification is. And the simplest way to understand what justification is is that it's simply a declaration. It's simply a declaration from God over your life. And if you go back to chapter 3, chapter 3 is where Paul starts his discussion on justification. He will say in verse 20, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. 
Justification is a declaration. Now, what's interesting about the connection between Romans 5, verse 1, and Romans 3, verse 20, is that the Greek word here that is used for justified, since we have been justified, is the same Greek word that Paul uses to say we have been declared righteous. It's the Greek word dikaio. It means the same thing, justified, declared righteous. Those two ideas are the same in Greek. Justification is simply a declaration from God about and over your life. And declarations can be powerful, right? Declarations can be powerful both in a positive sense and in a negative sense. I'm sure that there are many of us here this morning who have had things said to us, about us, said over us when we were younger that have stayed with us, both for the good and for the bad. There's probably been things that have been said about you and to you and over you that you're like, it's, just, it's like clung to me and it's weighing me down and I play that thing over and over and over in my mind. And, and God is doing that when he justifies us. He is declaring something over us and declarations are powerful. I can remember when I was a youth pastor, um, I was actually kind of in this weird season of transitioning from youth ministry into, you know, more adult ministry. And the youth pastor at our church at the time had signed up our kids to go on this summer camp, but they weren't able to take the kids on that trip. And so they said, hey, Brian, would you be willing to take the kids on this summer camp trip? And I was like, yeah, that was great. We were in Atlanta at the time. The camp was in, as a beach camp in South Carolina. And so one of the things that we did after one of the sessions was they were trying to teach identity to the kids. And so afterwards, they, after one of the sessions, they said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to take the cinder block. They gave every group a cinder block and a Sharpie. And you had to write down things on the cinder block that were things that were maybe said about you or things that you believed about yourself that were kind of negative. And then they gave you a big sledgehammer or you were to take the cinder block and drop it on the ground in order to symbolize the breaking of those negative things about you and then shift to speaking words of affirmation into one another's lives. This great powerful moment of kids trying to speak identity and help other people see how God sees them in terms of they are loved and accepted. And so I have this piece of paper in my office and I have this rock in my office because that moment was really significant for me. Even though it's a youth exercise, it was really significant for me. I kept a piece of that cinder block because one of the things that I was struggling with in that season was this belief that I'm not a very good pastor. If anything, I was a below average pastor. And so we were supposed to like share with each other like what we were writing and why, and I shared that with the kids that sometimes I feel like I'm just a below average pastor. And then we break the rock and then we take this piece of paper, you put your name on the paper and you pass it around to everybody in the group. And then the kids are supposed to write things that are affirming about other people. So on that piece of paper, one kid put your above average, which I thought was great. I was like, thank you, thank you. And then somebody else wrote on there that you're a good pastor. And that was super meaningful to me, right? It was like this declaration in my life that I'm above average and I'm a good pastor. And so I've kept that rock and I've kept that piece of paper for about 10 years because there are days I still don't feel like that great of a pastor. There are still days I feel like a below average pastor and I need to remember, no, like my identity is not somebody who is below average. My identity is somebody who is loved and accepted by God. And that's a little reminder from teenagers who probably are now adults who have told me and spoke identity into my life because declarations are powerful and declarations have the ability to shape and change your life. And the declaration that God is giving when he justifies us is the declaration of righteous, that you are righteous. Now we tend to think of righteousness in church circles in moral terms. Righteousness is when we do good things and we avoid bad things. But in the scriptures, we see that righteousness is about right standing. Righteousness is a relational word, and it's about right standing with God 
and his people. So when you are declared to be righteous, you are declared to be in right standing, in right relationship, in a good place between you and God, because righteousness, while it has moral implications, it's a relational term. So when God says you are declared to be righteous, he, he's saying like you and I are on good terms. You and I are in good relationship. You and I are in a tight place. And the way that this declaration happens, he says, is through faith. He goes on to say, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and what Paul is doing here is he's contrasting this idea of works of the law with faith. Because again, in chapter 3, verse 20, he said, no one will be justified. No one will be declared righteous based on the works of the law. Rather, you will be declared righteous. You will be justified on the basis of your faith. Paul is contrasting faith and works, meaning the implication being justification isn't a declaration that you earn. Justification isn't a declaration that you achieve. Rather, declaration is a declaration of something you receive. You just receive it as true. Meaning justification isn't determined by your spiritual or moral performance, which is good news. Because my moral and spiritual performance some days is not that great. And Paul is saying your justification isn't dependent on your performance. It's dependent on your faith or your confidence in Jesus. And he's saying for those who are followers of Jesus, he's naming that justification being declared in the right with God is your current reality. Even though certain things in your life this past week may not have aligned with that reality. God still gives you this declaration. And then Paul goes on to say, here's how specifically it's impacting your life. Essentially, here's what justification does for you. He goes on to say, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's important to note that this is peace with God, Paul is not saying that we have the peace of God. Those are two very different things. The peace of God would be something that's more internal in nature. It might feel more comforting in nature. And you see this in Paul's letter to the Philippians in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So in Romans 5, Paul isn't talking about the peace of God. He's talking about peace with God. Peace with God is relational peace. Peace with God is relational unity, relational harmony. God is declaring that you are in a right relationship with him because the opposite of peace with God would be strife with God animosity between you and God. Paul will say later on in chapter 5 that at one point in time, we were enemies with God. The thing that causes that hostility when we're enemies with God is our sin. Sin in the world, sin in our lives, sin that has broken down the goodness of God's creation because we were all created to be in close, tight-knit, intimate, interdependent relationship with God. But sin has broken and fractured that relationship. And at one point in time, the scriptures describe us as being enemies with God. But the one who mended our relationship with God is Jesus Christ. That's why he says we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, through his sacrificial death on the cross, dealing with the entirety of the world's sin at that moment. He bridges the gap between us and God. He reconciles us to God, restores us in a rightful place with God, so now we can have peace with God. We can have confidence in our relationship with God, and we don't have to stress about moral performance in order to please God. We rest in the peace that we have. 
He goes on to say, what justification does for you is it gives you peace with God. And then he says in verse 2, through whom, right, through Jesus, we have gained access, again, by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So justification not only gives you peace with God, it gives you access to grace. Now, I would say that an underdeveloped faith mindset is going to see grace as permission. That God is obligated to cover my wrongdoings, so therefore it gives me permission to live however I want, right? Sometimes when we see grace in that way, we would say that's an underdeveloped mindset. Paul will address that at the beginning of chapter 6. He says, if you think that grace just gives you permission to live however you want, you're way off track. We would also say that a partially developed faith mindset would define grace as forgiveness. That grace wipes away my sin, which it does. Grace absolutely deals with our sin. But the reason I would say that's a partially developed faith mindset in grace is because grace isn't only forgiveness. Grace is also power. So a fully developed faith mindset sees God's grace as life and power. It's not this thing that just takes care of my past, but it's the thing that fuels me to live in the present. Grace is God's life-changing fuel for my daily life, every day. So when we moved here in 2006, um, 2016 rather, the house we moved into at that time um, didn't have an outlet for our electric dryer. We get our dryer downstairs, we go to get everything set up, and I go to put it in there and there's no outlet on the wall. I'd never seen this before because every other house we'd lived in had an outlet, but it had this pipe for a gas dryer. And I'm like, I am not buying a new dryer. Like, I have just moved across the country. I don't know how to make sense of life. The last thing I need to do is go buy a new dryer. So then I start figuring out what do we do, and it turns out what we had to do is call an electrician who would run, you know, the right outlet so we could plug it in. What he did was he gave us access to power because now we could plug in our dryer. Before that, like, dryers are great. I mean, can you imagine having to, like, live in a world where you hang your clothes outside? Like, how inconvenient and atrocious that would be, right? <laughs> oh, dryers are phenomenal. I just take these wet, soppy clothes, I throw them in, and like I come back an hour later and they're dry, right? Especially when you have the snow and the rain to deal with when you're hanging clothes outside. Ugh. But without power, a dryer is useless. Like it's just a big metal box that you can't do anything with in your basement, right? You need power in order for it to run and to do the thing that it was created to do. We're the same way. Grace is that power. Grace is that fuel. Grace is God's life coming into us and moving through us so that we can be the people he's called to be. Grace doesn't simply just wash away our sins, although it does. It gives us more than that. So we have gained access to God's grace. We have peace with God. And then the other thing that we see is it gives us hope. It says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So justification gives us hope and confidence. And notice the object of our hope. It says the object of our hope is the glory of God, which is an interesting thought. Because we don't typically use the term glory in our day-to-day -day lives, do we? And if we do, we usually use it in terms of maybe obtaining glory, meaning maybe obtaining recognition and honor, thinking of glory in terms of somebody giving you esteem, or we think in terms of glory being something we observe and something we take in. So glory in that sense is defined as beauty or majesty or splendor. We might say, oh, I saw this sunset and it was glorious. But here Paul is saying we put our hope in glory and specifically we put our hope in God's glory. And here's where, interestingly enough, here's where this passage begins to really answer the question, what does your faith do for you? When the rubber hits the road, what does it do for you? And what Paul goes on to say is that our faith, interestingly enough, in God's glory, gives us hope in hard times. 
Because this is what he says next in verse 3. Not only so, he says, when we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Now, the word choice there for glory in our sufferings, I think, is an interesting word choice by the NIV. Because the Greek word there is actually the same Greek word as it is in the previous verse when it says, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. The word boast there is the same Greek word here as glory. So you could say, not only so, but we boast in our sufferings, or we rejoice. Some translations will say we rejoice in our sufferings. And that's not saying we rejoice because of our sufferings. That's not saying we boast because of our sufferings. That would be taking pleasure and pain, and that's kind of weird and twisted. Rather, what Paul is saying is that we boast in the midst of our sufferings. We have the ability to rejoice in the midst of our sufferings, even when life is hard, because he goes on to say, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, which means that with God, your pain in life is not wasted. Your sufferings, your hardships, your challenges are not all for naught. Meaning God can and will use your suffering and your pain in a redemptive way if you submit it to him. He will, he will somehow bring good out of it, both for you and for others, if you can put it in front of him. And that's not to say he inflicts pain on you in order to use it for good, but he uses the pain in your life in order for good. He can bring something good into your life through it, both for you and others. So that means if you're here this morning and on Friday you were just given a pink slip and you're like, what in the world am I going to do now? God is with you in that moment. And he has the ability to bring good out of it. If you have just received some sort of cancer diagnosis in this past week and you're like, I have six months to live and what's going to happen? Paul is saying, God is with you in that moment. And he has the ability to redeem and bring something out of it. God is working through your hardship. So we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, he says, and character, hope. And he goes on to say, and hope does not put us to shame, which is another way of hope does not disappoint us. Sometimes it can seem foolish and naive to hope in the midst of difficult circumstances. And Paul's saying, it's not naive and not fo foolish at all. If anything, it's courageous. And you should continue to hope because hope is a good thing. In the words of Shawshank Redemption, maybe the best thing because hope never dies. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through his Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. God desires good things for you. God wants to bring about good things in your life, even when you're in the midst of something difficult, atrocious, and painful. So essentially, you could say what Paul is trying to communicate in the first five verses of Romans 5 is that God's glory gives us hope in hard times. What does your faith for you do for you? Your faith gives you hope in hard times, specifically in the glory of God. But we have to ask a question about that. The question being like, how in the world does that work? Like, how does it work that if we're saying God is glorious, and if we're defining glory as beauty, majesty, splendor, honor, recognition, and renown, how does hoping in God's glory give me hope in hard times, right? I don't know if you have seen this news story surfacing the last couple weeks, but it's one that's caught my attention and just really been giving me a great heartache. Uh, there was a story of a family that was a, a, from, I think it was Surring, Wisconsin, which is north of Green Bay. A, a father with like three young kids, two daughters and a boy, and he decided to take his two girls to a concert here in Milwaukee a couple weeks ago. So after school, loads him up, takes him to this concert at the Pfizer on the way home, as he's driving back up north, falls asleep while he's driving, goes off the road, is in this massive car accident, and his youngest daughter, his eight-year-old, dies in the car accident. I mean, just talk about, like, heart-wrenching. Now, if I were to go to, like, I don't know anything of this family. I don't know what their faith walk is. But if I were to go to this family and say, hey, you can put your hope in God's beauty and everything's going to be fine, 
They're going to be like, like, what? Like somebody fix this. That's what I want. I want somebody to fix this. I don't want to just observe some God who's supposed to be glorious and beautiful. I want somebody to fix this. So when we say that observing God's glory or putting hope in God's beauty in hard times is going to make us feel better about our circumstances, like that can seem very disconnected. But it all depends on how we understand glory and what Paul is doing here when he talks about glory. Because Romans 5 starts a new section in Paul's letter that will go through Romans 8. And by the time you get to Romans 8, you're going to find that there are certain themes that are in these five verses at the beginning of Romans 5 that surface again, that connect chapter 5 to chapter 8 and make it a cohesive section, right? You see this in chapter 8, verse 18. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings, right? There's that idea of pain and suffering, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So in that one verse, Paul is making the connection between persevering through sufferings and hoping in the glory of God with this glory that he says will one day be revealed in us. And then he says this in verse 28. And we know that in all things, all things, even in the hardest of times, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Right? So again, another word connecting chapter 8 with chapter 5. And with those he justified, he also glorified. And so what Paul, what Paul is saying is that what God is trying to do is not just simply put God's glory on display for us to observe, but he's trying to call us into God's glory so that we become participants of it and his glory is revealed not just to the world, but also to us, in us, and through us. God is working to bring his glory to us, meaning that in this world, when we face death, when we face suffering, when we face the loss of a young child and what was supposed to be a one wonderful family moment, we can know with certainty that death doesn't have the last word. That the suffering in our life doesn't win in the end. And that one day all that is broken in this world will be restored. So for this family north of Green Bay who has just lost their eight-year-old daughter one day, and I don't know how all this works, but because of our hope in God's glory, because his glory is most beautifully seen in the resurrection, we have hope that one day all things that are broken will be restored and death won't have the last word. The thing that does have the last word is God's glory. Is God's life his power, and he's looking to extend that glory to us, through us, for us, to call us into it. So yes, Paul is saying, here's how justification does something for you. It gives you hope. It gives you hope in God's glory. It helps you move through hard times specifically because God's glory is most fully revealed, will be most fully revealed when Jesus returns to make all things right. And so if you're here this morning and you're in a world of pain and you're in a world of hurt, justification means something to you because it gives you hope. It gives you hope that the pain and the, the, the suffering that you're sitting in right now doesn't ultimately define your life. But Jesus' power, God's love, his spirit that is available to you is the defining reality of your life. And it seems to me that the call of this passage is for us to nurture hope because sometimes hope can be lost. Sometimes hope can disappear and it's like all I see is darkness, gloom, and despair, and there is no hope. But the call of this passage is to nurture hope in real time. And one of the ways that we nurture hope is through the Lord's table, is through the Lord's supper. Because in this simple meal, we have a reminder that Jesus knows. He knows the pain, the heartache, the suffering that you're experiencing because he went through his own pain and suffering on the cross. 
In that moment, he was disconnected from God. His relationship with God was not defined by peace in that moment, but defined by the sin of the world, so ultimately we could have peace. He was disconnected from God's grace, God's love, God's life, and his power so that we could have those things. What appeared to the disciples as being hope lost has now been restored for us who are on this side of the cross. And so we're invited to come to this table in order to nurture the hope that we have in Jesus. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and invite the worship team to start making their way up. And